This part of our course is going to deal with three laws of motion developed by Isaac Newton. Newton's laws allow us to go beyond the kinematical equations for position, velocity, and acceleration, which really provide no explanation of the sources of this motion. And Newton's laws allow us to ascribe those things like acceleration to an action or a, an entity which causes the motion. So think about Newton's laws as the search for a cause. There are three laws of motion from Isaac Newton, and the first is, it reads as follows, that an object at rest will stay at rest, an object in motion will stay in motion, unless acted upon by a force. And this last clause, unless acted upon by a force, is extremely important. The force idea is something familiar to us. It's an idea of a push or a pull. So if you're pulling on a rope, you're, you're causing a force. Or if you're pushing on a table, you're, you're exerting a force. And this last clause, this idea that, that unless acted upon by a force, what is that saying? It means that it's a change in speed or a change in velocity. In other words, when, it's, when Newton's first law reads, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, it means that an object is, might be going along at constant speed, and if it's not being acted on for, by a force, it's going to stay at that speed. The only reason it would change in speed, or change in velocity, actually, is if it's acted upon by a force. So you don't have to have a force to keep moving. That's the kind of corollary of this. In other words, you can have constant speed and keep moving on down the road, even if there's no force. It might be helpful to have an example. Imagine you're sitting here on a boat out in the water, and it's not a windy day, so the boat is standing still. If you're not moving, the boat, the boat probably isn't going to move either, and this is exact, an example of the first part of Newton's first law, which says that an object is at that's at rest stays at rest. Now imagine you hop off the boat. You push off with your foot right here. This is exerting a force over to the right. Well, as a result of you pushing on the boat with a force, now the, the, bo the boat will start to go into motion. So that's the change in speed. Once you've hopped off the boat and you're on the dock, you might know that a boat will just glide along the water. So it doesn't stop moving the moment you, you stop touching the boat. It keeps on gliding. Now there are limitations to that that we have in the real world, but the idea is that this is like a smooth uh, water and, and doesn't provide much friction. So the boat keeps on gliding away from us. But it glides away at more or less constant speed because of Newton's first law. Because the moment I've stopped acting on the boat with a force, what, the, what does the boat do? It tends to remain in that motion that it was in uh, at the end of the force. This may be surprising to many of you or confusing because you think that you must have to push on something to keep it moving. You're not alone. In fact, the following little question from the textbook Physics and Everyday Thinking sort of exemplifies the confusion held by many people. The, the diagram here shows a girl playing soccer, and she's kicked a ball. So imagine the ball was here, and now it's moving off to the right as a result of her kick. So this graph down below graphs two quantities, the speed of the ball as a function of time. And there are four time periods shown, time period A, time period B, C, and D. Time period A is the time when the ball is just sitting here on the ground and it's not been kicked yet. Time period B is the process of kicking the ball. Time period C is when the ball is rolling along in the grass. And time period D is when the ball is slowing down in the net because the net's stopping the ball. 
many people when asked when is the force from the girl acting on the ball in this graph would answer that it's it's acting both in time period B and in time period C. The basis for their answer is that if the ball is moving forward, then there must be a force pushing it forward all the way along. And this is understandable. Uh, it dates, it's a point of view held back, going all the way back to Aristotle, that uh, an object moving must require a force to keep it moving. But it's not the it's not the statement from Newton's first law. In fact, Newton's first law suggests that once I've tapped that ball, it should just keep on moving on its own. Now, of course, that would mean that the change in speed right here is as a result of the force from the girl, and Newton's first law should suggest that after the girl is done kicking the ball, it should just continue it constant speed. So why doesn't it? It's slowing down. Well, do we require a force moving forward to keep an object moving along in that direction? If that was the case, if that was not the case, in fact Newton's first law is correct, shouldn't I just be able to push on a piano it give it a little tap and it should just keep on moving forward on its own because during the tap I'm exerting a force and I'm causing it to change speed but after the tap it should have come up to some speed and it should just continue on its way why is it we have to pay a piano mover so much why can't I just move the piano it's myself well the answer is that most uh, real-life examples that we're familiar with, like moving a piano, involve another force out there that's known as friction. And the reason the pianos slow down after we push on them is because the force of friction is acting. It's, we're not the only force in the problem. Our push, that is, the force of friction is also uh, acting on the piano. So we have to imagine a scenario or, or a, an example where there would be little or very no, uh, very little or no friction at all. And that's kind of hard because most of the examples we're familiar with actually have friction present. One example that's very common to think about because it's, it's something we're, many of us are familiar with, at least those of us not in Texas, from Texas, is something where you're sliding on the ice because the smooth ice has relatively little friction. So if we could give something a push, and just let it slide along. We know we can think, imagine that it would slide along freely on the ice without slowing down or without slowing down very much. An important point to keep in mind about force is that force is a vector. So we're going to, on a regular basis, talk about the net force or total force. By total, we mean that we have to sum up all the forces, so we sum over some index from i equals 1 on up to n, however many forces there are present, all the forces in a problem. And this is a vector sum, so we have an arrow right here over the force sign. What, is, what do we mean by that? Well, if let's consider, consider this tug-of-war game. In a tug-of-war game, we have folks pulling off to the left and off to the right. So this almost looks like a one-dimensional problem because the rope doesn't move. We imagine this little point right here on the rope. That piece, piece of rope doesn't move because it's being pulled upon with equal force, F1. And here's F force F2. And we have F2 is minus F1. In other words, when I add all the forces together, the net force will be zero, and I expect no change in speed for the object. I expect the rope not to move. But what would happen if someone came in and pushed this rope or pulled on this rope really hard from the side? So if we had a teacher stand right here. Well, all these kids would go plummeting to the ground because they're pulling only along the length of the rope in this direction, off to the side, the left, 
or off the side over here to the right. If I came in and pushed along this way, that's perpendicular to these other two directions, and there would be a net force. And so I would have a change in speed. In other words, everyone would go pushing off this way because nothing as a vector was acting to oppose this mischievous teacher who wanted to 